aren't compelled to loan your car to anyone who wants it, but you are compelled to surrender your school-age child to strangers who possess children for a livelihood, even though one in every nine school children is terrified of physical harm happening to them in school, terrified with good cause. We found a disturbing number of recent school shooters were either on medication or were experiencing withdrawal. If I demanded you give up your television to an anonymous itinerant repairman who needed work, you'd think I was crazy. If I came with a policeman who forced you to pay that repairman Man, even after he broke your set, you would be outraged. So why are you so docile when you give up your child to a government agent called the school teacher? I want to open up concealed aspects of modern schooling, such as the deterioration it forces in the morality of parenting. You have no say at all in choosing your teachers. You know nothing about their backgrounds or families. And the state knows little more than you do. This is as radical a piece of social engineering as the human imagination can conceive. What does it mean? One thing you do know is how unlikely it will be for any teacher to understand the personality of your particular child or anything significant about your family, culture, religion, plans, hopes, dreams. In the confusion of school affairs, even teachers so disposed don't have the opportunity to know those things. How did this happen? Before you hire a company to build a house, you would, I expect, insist on detailed plans showing what the finished structure was going to look like. Building a child's mind and character is what public schools do. Their justification for prematurely breaking family and neighborhood learning. Where is the documentary evidence to prove this assumption that trained and certified professionals do it better than people who know and love them can? There isn't any. The cost in New York State for building a well-schooled child in the year 2000 is $200,000 per body when lost interest is calculated. That capital sum invested in the child's name over the past 12 years would have delivered a million dollars to each kid as a nest egg to compensate for having no school. The original $200,000 is more than the average home in New York costs. You wouldn't build a home without some idea of what it would look like when finished, but you are compelled to let a core of perfect strangers tinker with your child's mind and personality without the foggiest idea of what they want to do with it. Law courts and legislatures have totally absolved school people from liability. You can sue a doctor for malpractice, not a school teacher. Every home builder is accountable to customers years after the home is built, not school teachers though. You can't sue a priest, a minister, or rabbi either. That should be a clue. If you can't be guaranteed even minimal results by these institutions, not even physical safety, if you can't be guaranteed anything except that you'll be arrested if you fail to surrender your kid, just what does the public in public schools mean? Hello, this is Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network every Thursday at 1 p.m. And uh, you can also find me on theseedsofliberty.com and theconsciousresistance.com. So today I'm at uh, Brooklyn uh, and I'm here with Brett Vanat, uh, who runs the School Sucks uh, podcast as well as uh, schoolsucksproject.com. Um, uh, and uh, he does a lot of work uh, talking about government school, uh, unschooling, homeschooling, things like that. Uh, so going to have a great conversation. Absolutely. Brett. Real education, I would, I would add to that. That's what we try to focus on. In the beginning, it was about school sucking, but now I think it's really more about what does education actually mean and how can, how can we deliver some of it uh, through our platform. So that's what we work on today. Cool. Yeah, I first heard about um, uh, Brett. Uh, actually, I, I, I mean, I heard about it a while ago, but I then I discovered Jeff Till and I interviewed him. He's an awesome, awesome guy. wrote an awesome, awesome article. So I really, you know, I love promoting homeschooling unschooling because i have a five-year-old three-year-old and uh, we definitely plan on homeschooling more like unschooling um and uh and so i love to get different perspectives on how people are doing it because i get asked so many so many times you know uh what's a typical day um are you the only one <laughs> you know things like that so do, do you find that kind of stuff do you, you get that um yeah and those seems like really hard questions to answer don't they oh yeah oh yeah big time <laughs> and how have you done it 
Well, I, I basically, um, well, I'm, that's why I'm developing these archive of people because I can just direct them. Like, look at these interviews. Look at this person is doing it. This person, Dana Martin, um, you know, there's a bunch of others. There's one woman who unschooled her kids in the 80s when before even unschooling was a term. Yeah. <laughs> but like John Holt just, just discovered it, just uh, named it, I guess. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so tell me about the history of your podcast and, and like how it's developed and evolved. Sure, yeah. I mean, I, just to jump off what you just said, I feel like it's really important. I need to be better organized about doing this. Building a compendium of people's unschooling or alternative education experiences even if they involve some school out of public school like oh we tried sending our kids to Sudbury and here's how it worked or I was even in a situation where we had to survive the public schools because mom and dad were divorced and they had different attitudes about education you know so those things happen and just saying like here's all the different situations that people find themselves in and try and provide as broad like as horizontal and vertical of an approach and information as we can. So that's something that I'm really hoping to build out a little better over over the next couple of years or so. I really those were motorcycles. Wow. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're just on the side of the street in Brooklyn. This is this is great. Um, so originally, uh, and I said this before, I needed to deal with what I saw as the hidden lessons of school that were delivered. Not like all the teachers get together and say, here's the checklist that you will work from to indoctrinate these children and ruin their lives. But just the, the side effects or the consequences of that kind of top-down domination system, that kind of milieu that school is. And the lessons seem to be obedience, almost a kind of reflective, uh, reflexive obedience, you know, that because school only works if everybody follows the rules, then people graduate with these very obedient mindsets. You know, even uh, and, and really obviously scales to the state very nicely in that case. Uh, another one was conformity, people being afraid uh, largely due to the, the social implications of individuality in school, middle school and high school. People are really afraid to assert themselves, their own personalities. And even if they can, it has to be in the context of a safe group who's also doing the same things, which is why we see, you know, the formation of cliques, or I think that's a big part of it. And a lot of it is about school survival, too. And giving up individual individuality for the sake of conformity, and giving up volition for the sake of obedience, the first two lessons of school, I think produces a kind of intellectual, philosophical, political apathy, right? So people, are, I mean, you, you, how many conversations have we had with people who are like, ah, you know, whatever, man, I just don't really care, you know? <laughs> right. um, that's very common. Yeah. Yeah. And that can show up in just complete disregard for what's going on around us in some people, or a kind of tacit acceptance of things at face value. Like, people are driving around with Trump stickers on their car. How did that happen? Doesn't seem like anybody who spent 15,000 hours being educated shouldn't have one of those. <laughs> but, you know, thousands of people do. Tens of thousands. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is the guy leading in the polls. So, and, and there's, there's lots of examples throughout my life that demonstrate people are not really being educated through the school system. And in the beginning of the show, I thought it was really important to say, here's what I think the three most important but subtle lessons of school are. Never stated explicitly, but they're always kind of running along in the background of the 15,000 hours we spend there. And from there, we kind of move from problems with school to problems within the family that are often created as a result of school. Um, problems with understanding history, like contextual history of certain events, like how did George Bush get away in 2000 uh, with saying that the U.S. Army has only ever been used for liberation. It's quite a statement, mm -hmm. you know, and it requires a lot of people to be pretty ignorant of history. So I was hitting things pretty hard for the first year and a half or so. And then I really wanted to transition into a more constructive conversation. So critical thinking, um, better relationships through better communication, um, productivity, and answers to some of these alternative education questions. So I really like the show. I, I want new people to find the show who are in the position you're in, you know, with two young children, and you're looking for uh, answers to how their education is going to play out you know, over, really over their lives. It's a lifelong thing. And I want them to be able to walk away saying, I found value in that. I think there's a place, I think, for commiserating about the problems with school, but it's not what my show's about. And I would say it's been like 
four solid years of really trying to focus on the constructive side. And for a long time, I said, if anything, if something has educational value, I'll do a show about it. But now I really kind of want to hone in on a series of more specific topics, you know, critical thinking, productivity, self-esteem, uh, better communication. And I still want to be able to deal with school issues, maybe more through like a YouTube channel where people seem to go for their, you know, negativity fill. But I want the, the stuff that's audio content to be really positive, to be really constructive. And I want people to walk away thinking, hey, yeah, I had some real questions about my own uh, schooling past or what the educational future of my children is going to look like. And I want to be able to, to help them with that and bring in, you know, other great voices like Jeff Till, who you mentioned, but um, the libertarian unschool, uh, unschooler, Anna Martin, who was a guest a while back. She was terrific. Dana Martin. Uh, and uh, there's probably a handful of other people that I just can't recall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but organizing that information, making it very easily accessible to the people who come to the site looking for that, and delivering it and continuing to find more of those people to have more in-depth conversations with them because everybody's kids are different. Everybody's family is different. Everybody's situation in which this uh, education is going to take place is different. So just to give people as broad a sample as we possibly can of what real education looks like for very young children, for you know middle school age children, for teens, for adults. Um, and uh, that's what I see really as the future of the show. Uh, yeah, very cool. I, um, yeah, the idea about focusing on the positive and the optimistic, uh, you know, I realize like when people discover, they, they search, you know, government politics and laws and taxes and it's such a negative thing to realize the violence in the system. And then it's so easy to, you know, har you know, you know, hover over that and, and, and stay, you know, transfixed on that, you know, in the wars and the drone strikes and all that kind of stuff. And I, and I have to constantly tell people that volunteerism is a peaceful philosophy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about love. It's about compassion, right? It's about uh, believing in each other rather than in political masters. And so, yeah, you're right. We have to focus on that, I think, if we want to make our philosophy attractive to others. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, you caught me at the right time because I just finished with Jeffrey Tucker, so I'm all uh, chewed it up with, <laughs> with optimism right now. So I, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think present, I used to say presenting this in a way that makes it look cool, but I just settled for making, the, making it look appealing. You, if you have something that is a powerful message that you want to attract new people to that message, to that philosophy, it has to look appealing, right? It has to look like you're having a good time within that whatever that thing is. Yeah. So, you know, individual, like, personal freedom, and, and that can include, you know, freedom from past traumatic events or emotional challenges or financial insecurity, and, and, and being able to showcase that. And I think that, that more uh, authentic, self-directed education delivers more opportunities to, to do that, to say, hey, come look what we're doing, we're having fun, it really, all that really matters is that you get it right for yourself, and then you can scale it from there. You know, can you go into a little bit about your background? Like you said, you're a public school teacher. You were, and, Never, and, and no. are, you, was. are you? All right. So my, uh, I was a public school student oh. for 15, uh, 12 years, okay, okay. Uh, which I think is qualification enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> I wanted to be a public school teacher. Oh, okay, I went okay. to uh, school to get a certificate. I did a master's program that I wound up dropping out of. Oh. I student taught in public schools. I then went and I taught in what is nominally private schools, oh. even though the state funds the uh, presence of the children who are there, yeah. essentially. So a lot of the kids are in the custody of the state. So they're essentially public schools that are privately run. Mm. And uh, after I quit that in 2006, I became a private tutor working in the greater Boston area. So I was able to see the public school environment and experience from a variety of different angles. I got to be shocked by all the things that had changed since I had been a student. I got to be shocked by all the things that were somehow exactly the same from the time when I was a student. And uh, I felt like that was a more educational experience than actually working in the public schools as a teacher is having one job in one place like there's people who, who don't even have a different classroom over the 25 you know they might wow. see they might see the cafeteria their classroom and the teacher's lounge wow. so I was kind of it's interesting I've never really thought about it like this before but I was on this tour 
of the Massachusetts and New Hampshire uh, public schools, you know, from all these different uh, vantage points. Like, this is what it looks like for the student. This is what it's like for the teachers. This is what it's like for the parents. This is what it's like to sit in a meeting with a guidance counselor. This is what it's like to try and build a principal's enthusiasm about being able to boost SAT scores and him telling you that I don't care about SAT scores. Boost the state test that they're making me give to the kids because that's what they use to, to measure the school. I, I would be happy to bring you in if you can get some of this heat off of me, you know, th those kind of conversations. So lots of interesting angles and vantage points. And I, and I did that for, gosh, really like six solid years, but then it kind of ran into a seventh year before I stopped taking new clients for tutoring to just basically pursue school sucks full time as a job. Wow. That's what I do now. Very cool, very cool. All right, yeah, you definitely have a, a great background to to speak from. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I think people need to hear this message about homeschooling and unschooling because it's still viewed as the fringe thing, although I, th I, I see a lot more people are, you know, coming out of the woodwork and, you know, <laughs> it's like there's there's Facebook groups, there's websites, there's, you know, the Internet has been an amazing resource for people who want to learn more. Mm -hmm. And I'm just amazed at people who did it before there was a, <laughs> the Internet, you know, because yeah, even yeah. with the Internet, people are afraid, right? Even still, you know, with all that information. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is growing. And I felt like I was talking more into a tin can six years ago. And now, obviously, there's a lot more email coming in, people sharing their stories. We were kind of riding the coattails of a couple other shows like Free Domain Radio and Free Talk Live in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So we were just like taking on a lot of their listeners and they were saying, yeah, yeah I agree with what you're saying. You're doing, it's like what the, the people I listen to say. So good for you for having the same message. But over time we've established more of our own audience and I've, I've had a lot of people come to me with their, I've gotten a lot of guests that way too. Like, oh, Brett, you know, I'm an unschool. I was unschooled, or I'm an unschooling parent, and I say, come on the show and share your story. Or sometimes they just want to share it with me through email. But I feel like having the perspective of doing this now for over six years that this is growing. And I've looked at some of the numbers, like, yes, homeschooling, and that can mean a lot of good things and a lot of bad things as an umbrella term, yeah. is on its way up yeah. just in the, in the last 10 years. So that's, that's encouraging to get really, really pumped up about that growth. I'd want to know what people are doing, you know, if they don't think the schools are, like, conservative enough or they don't think the schools are progressive enough. Those would be things I had problems with. But... Um, I generally think that there is this, this realization, especially as um, we go further and further into the age of information, that what school is delivering, by and large, is not education. You know, it's, it's, it's indoctrination. Oh, yeah. So I, I'm optimistic that people are, are waking up to that. So if you were to meet somebody who's on the fence about homeschooling, they've heard about it and they're not really sure about it, you know, if it's good for their child, what would, what would you say to them <laughs> as an encouragement? I don't know. I, I'd have to know a lot about them before I would really say anything, you know. So I'd want to know what's important to them, oh, what are their, okay. uh, what would be their issues, what causes them pain, what causes them concern, what would they say made them happy or satisfied in their own educational experience? Do they have children? Do they not have children? And I think to just, I don't really have any talking points that I would just deliver to any critic. Right. I would want to have uh, as honest and thorough a conversation as possible with anybody that I was really committed to convincing. Mm -hmm. But I'd want to know what their issues, what's important to them, their fears, their concerns. Uh, before I, I approach that, um, if you if you could create a uh, you know a fantasy person, and I could answer the question that way. But I think what's really important is that you just you're tailoring a message to whoever you're talking about. There there is such a, a an array of uh, different approaches to dealing with the school versus education issue. Right? School has created so many problems. Yeah. And education, like especially self-directed education, has so many tremendous benefits um, that you have a wide variety of uh, approaches to having that conversation with somebody who's a skeptic. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I've uh, <laughs> definitely encountered that a lot. My, my parents, my grandparents uh, <laughs> done a lot to convince me. My sister is a, uh, a speech-language pathologist in a public school. <laughs> so, so I definitely get a lot of criticism 
uh, a lot of backlash, but you know what? Um, we all do what we feel is the best for our kid. You know, I don't blame my parents for putting me to public school because I'm sure they did the best that they could, right? With mm-hmm. what they thought, they, you know, I don't think parents are evil or malicious. They're like want to indoctrinate their kids. They just they're um, they're responding to the, the the upbringing they got, and they think that let's just propagate the same. If you know, if I went through it. You have to go through it, you know? It's the appeal to antiquity. It's like, if we're, everyone's doing it, you do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. So, um, my answer was a cop-out. So, you said, <laughs> your sister is a, works in the system. Right. Right? Yeah. So, it's interesting, because... Now, that's the answer that I go... Cause that's the most genuine answer I can give, but it's not an answer to your question. So, now we have someone to work with, somebody who works inside the system, okay, right? Okay. And it, it's interesting because I had a, I did an interview. The first interview I did when I got here yesterday was with a girl who just happened to be standing outside the, the We Are Change uh, t-shirt vending station. And I asked her what she did, and she said she was a public school teacher. So, I said, I'd like to talk to you. Um, and we went out off to, like, a quiet space, and we talked. And she told me what she liked about the job. She teaches middle school Spanish. And she said she really, really likes the interactions with the kids. She thinks the kids are great. That kind of blew my theory out of the water that kids in middle school are just like zombies, like, you know, in this darkness, dragging around these backpacks and filling out worksheets and hating life. And she said it's like a really positive and energizing experience for her to be able to interact with these kids. She knows she's having a positive difference. I said, that's all great. Tell me... It, I, and I just said to her, like, tell me something you don't like, basically. It, it kind of boiled down to that. Like, what's going on outside of your classroom? Uh-huh. Like, your classroom sounds great. The environment you've created, that you and your students create together, that sounds terrific. Let's tour the rest of the school. <laughs> and then it quickly got into, like, yeah, you know, I'm really kind of getting off easy when it comes to Common Core. That doesn't really affect me much. Or, you know, there's teaching Spanish really doesn't have these heavy indoctrination opportunities that like teaching history right, right. Or, or just the general environments of school would have like a foreign language class is more interactive but then like the bureaucracy came up the limitations of uh, teachers the limitations placed on teachers and so you just from there I just started to basically create a vision of what a freer environment would look like and how I think that somebody who's passionate and committed like she is would thrive more in that environment and that was that was successful so that was fairly easy i mean she's here at liberty it's kind of like um a hot lead right so she's here at liberty fest, liberty fest. her fiance is uh we are changes uh, webmaster oh, uh so okay. it was cool. it was an easier sell than most i've definitely talked to some people who are very difficult but if you're really concerned if you really want to convince them then I would say expressing a genuine concern about the problems that... It was your sister, you said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are the problems, sister, that you see, Mm -hmm. you know, in this environment? Like, sure, there's all these things about it that are good. You like your work. Your work gives you satisfaction. It should. And I think there's, you know, so many people who work in the public schools who have that story. But focusing on those enjoyable aspects of the job might be forcing a lot of people to neglect an examination of opportunity costs, right? Because if you, I mean, have you ever had the experience where like you're going through your Facebook newsfeed and you see something bad that's totally the state's fault and you go, yes, cool, right? I I don't know if that's happened to you, but it's very subtle, Okay. you know? It's not like you have to high five and celebrate with somebody, but it's like, oh yeah, the state did it, good. (laughs) Well, well, actually, the the more common thing is when things go wrong, they don't blame the state, and it really is due to government intervention, and yet they blame the free market or some business. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's more to, to me. That's a more common scenario. But it's been posted by some other liberty-minded people, and it's clearly right, right, like, right, look right, how right, the right, state right, screwed right, up here. Yeah, 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 and yeah. and this used to happen with me, and this is how I caught it. Like, I'd hear about something bad happening in a school, and I'd say, oh show prep you know i'd get i'd get like excited for a minute and then say wait that's totally inappropriate for me to get excited about something bad happening because it fuels my narrative you know the narrative that i'm presenting and i thought it was an interesting exercise to talk to this teacher yesterday who said hey look i love school and and this is a very positive experience i love my job i like these kids and i was like all right well let's see if you can just blow my mind and we and it turned into an interesting conversation because of that so um 
I think that if somebody is really, really, like, in their battle station with the guns pointed at you defensively, yeah. it's going to be hard to reach. So sure, you have to... Sure. Uh, you, And if you've already tried several times, the, the defensive walls might be built up a little higher. Yeah. And sometimes you might just have to, like, move on to the next opportunity. Uh, I, I, instead of thinking about walls, thinking about bridges that, like, lots of heavy information could be moving across. Um, when I was new to this stuff and very passionate and very angry, I was just lighting those bridges on fire, right? <laughs> right. And then just trying to throw the information across, you know? Um, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right. So I think a lot of people have to resign themselves like, hey, I really care about this person. I really want them to have a more nuanced or more enlightened view of this issue. Uh, but the, you know, the, the well is too poisoned. So. Yeah, 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 and the other thing I, I find that's pretty effective is, um, is you know, you want to influence people, you want to show them, you know, a better way, and so you live it. Mm -hmm. You live it with yourself, you live it with your kids, the way you raise your kids, you nine violently, you know, you homeschool, you unschool, and, uh, you know, they can have all the, uh, all the criticism they want, like, they're not going to learn how to read, write, history, math, all that stuff, but, uh, I mean, in the end, they're polite, <laughs> they're, they have a conscience, they're moral, they're decent people. Well, it's time they're compassionate. And, and to me, that's what's really important in a human being. You know, is it really important that we don't learn science, math, biology? Like, what's more important in the end is, is kindness and compassion. You know, that's, that's right. the way I look at it. You know? Absolutely. I, I totally agree. So, so, um, so yeah. But uh, if there's anything else you want to finish off before we, before we end? Uh, I would love to just uh, give my information and get yours so if I repost this on my site, people know where to find your work. So my website, schoolsucksproject.com. People can just search iTunes or wherever they're getting their podcasts uh, for School Sucks Podcast. They'll find us there. We have a YouTube channel. The username is School Sucks Podcast. And uh, a Facebook group, School Sucks Project. I know because back and forth a little bit. <laughs> and we have a Twitter. Our Twitter is School Sucks Show. So uh, that's how people can find us. And if you go to the site... With uh, a topic of interest in mind, we've done, you know, series on such a wide variety of topics from history to critical thinking to communication to self-esteem. Um, so try something out if you're new to the show, some area of interest of yours. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope people will join our community and share their thoughts or share their questions. And I'm trying to create more of a dialogue of, of listeners. So if people do get involved... Um, I'd like to hear from them. And I'd, I'd like more, more than me hearing from them through email. I would like people coming in with stories to share or questions to raise to hear from each other and talk with each other. Beautiful. Yeah, that's great. It's so important to create a dialogue, definitely. Uh, well, awesome. Thanks a lot. Oh, I'm uh, Peace Finicism, uh, peacefinicism.com, and Peace Finicism Facebook page, uh, Twitter, P, at P Anarchism, um, YouTube channel, Peace Finicism. So <laughs> pretty much consistent. Um, but yeah, I'll give you all that. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, this is that's uh, Brett Vinat from the School Sucks podcast. Uh, so this is Peace Finicism on the Voluntary Virtues Network and the Seas of Liberty.com and the Conscious Resistance.com. Wishing everyone have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.